Hello and welcome to the one, the only, although sometimes we get that wrong, Gaming Booth Podcast, Episode 2. I'm Mitch, your host, and joining me, as I assume probably always will be, is Russell. Greetings. And also, I don't know how long he'll be on for, it's Jordan. It's I, the disposable man. He is, and we're going to get rid of him a bit later, but before we get rid of him, as much as we want to get rid of him already, (laughs) this week we're discussing our most anticipated games for the rest of the year. And our favourites so far, but before we do any of that, we have a job to do. Because each week, we are required to solve a video game related problem in the multiverse. So this week, we're helping Earth-918G, most famous for radioactive termites, and being the only reality where Peter Molyneux never lies. Oh shit, that's a weird reality already. I know, so this week... You guys have two choices. You have to bring a game back from the dead, but a price must be paid, which you will find out after you pick your resurrection, because we don't know how the spell will go. So you can resurrect Scalebound, or you can resurrect PT, the Hideo Kojima Silent oh, yeah. Hills demo yeah. game. I mean, I, I don't want to step in over... Jordan, but I mean, it's literally a no-brainer. It has to be PT. I'm willing to take the risk no matter what the risk may be. Jordan? Well, I would probably more go scale-bound just because it looked cool because it had dragons in it, and dragons are always cool. But um, if we're going to do a coin toss, I'll go with Russell. Okay, well, because Silent Hills and the PT is back from the dead. However, in this universe, Horizon Zero Dawn... Never gets to exist. No! <laughs> the sacrifice! Sure survive. What's up, Jordan? I'm sure we can survive without it. But if, well, we, if, Horizon, it if Horizon Zero Dawn doesn't exist, does that mean Death Stranding doesn't exist? Because Kojima would still be working on VT? Well, this is, is, it, is a this whole different universe, so perhaps this is another Kojima works at Konami, but we don't actually know that information. But I do know that yeah. when Silent Hills came out, it was an utter disappointment, and no one actually enjoyed it. Because we never we never expected that to be bad, but in this universe, it was never going to be good. So, I hope you're glad about your decision. Horizon Zero Dawn is dead. I regret nothing. We have murdered that universe already. We murdered one game in that universe. One game well, is dead. multiple games. Who knows yeah. how, what the Decimer Engine led to, but we'll never get to see. So to move on from the whole multiverse segment we're going on to the news so to discuss the news for this week we are bringing a little common issue that never seems to end because we're talking crossplay more importantly we're talking sony and crossplay because we've seen a little trailer or ad whatever you want to call it from xbox and nintendo Joining forces to let everyone know that they're friends now. How weird is that? It's it kind of speaks to like where we are now, where it's like on the horizon of like the next generation. Zero like dawn. I wonder, <laughs> yeah, I wonder like how many people will connect together. Where it's like, oh, what used to be, you know, you could only play on Xbox is like, well, we don't care anymore. Like if you buy Call of Duty, whatever, Call of Duty Fifty Two, like you can play it on any console and you can play with your friends anywhere like admittedly the next generation could be a streaming service for all we know like that seems like everyone's going so uh it's it's just kind of like exciting times right now where it's like oh xbox and nintendo are like officially confirming things even though sony is very much like the empire in the background uh as they try to like uh the rebels so jordan if sony and xbox were friends would you be excited for that as a fan of xbox Mainly. <laughs> I believe it'd be a good thing for them to join up because then it'd be less uh, console exclusives and more incentive to buy games no matter what the console. But if you enjoyed a preference of controller, you'd stick with them over the others, but you could still play with whoever you wanted to play with. That's true. And I mean, I think personally the console wars would stop because people would be able to kill each other. So you could have like games where it's just like, we're on Sony's team and Xbox's team. It's like, you know how Splatoon 2 does this kind of, like... Yeah, yeah. Tomato sauce versus like, mayonnaise or something. I do want to mention, though, it's not really a non-Nintendo thing recently with them teaming up with Xbox, because they've been teaming up with other companies like Ubisoft to make games, so it's more of, like, they're opening 
up so it's bringing in other uh, consoles to start opening up like Xbox so it's only a matter of time hopefully before Sony does the same thing yeah so what we what we've heard about Sony's side of things we've heard that they don't want to let it happen because of the children there's a few other reasons but Sean Layden recently said they're looking at the possibilities now that doesn't necessarily confirm it but he doesn't necessarily deny it either so I, it, it definitely gives the vibe of they're getting so much shit right now where it's like it's very much like eyes shut if they don't know what's happening they know what's happening they just have to say something that doesn't imply something that can potentially be pushed back on them later where it's like oh we're definitely doing something it's like well we're thinking about it we're not sure what it is but at the same time it's probably still a corporate agenda like we don't want to just open the floodgates we want to still have some kind of lockout i'm thinking maybe we're talking about kind of pass or something we have to have like a sony pass or something to allow it to happen so there's still like money internal to sony it seems like there's something like that going on but i would I think eventually they're going to have to open up the gates. They can't just have them shut forever. Another subscription to their subscriptions? PlayStation I'd... Now. <laughs> Even <laughs> sooner, but I don't think that'll be the case. And I think as far as we know for like... Speaking of corporate, like when, when you're saying corporate, all I can think of will it be like the other publishers like EA, Bethesda, who Todd Howard's already said Sony isn't as helpful as everyone would like. So do we think it'll be them more so like than just the up outrage of us going raising our pitchforks and going, we need crossplay. Fortnite is the biggest crossplay game on the earth right now because you can play it on PC with Xbox, you can play it on PC with PS4 and stuff like that. Like the it's reasons actually, Fortnite yeah. is the new Minecraft. For PS4, is it in? <laughs> Have a look. Is that Jordan or Mitch? Hello <laughs> Siri. <laughs> uh, where were we? <laughs> Cause, because Fortnite's like a big deal right now because that's the reason this is even in the public like persona is because Sony fucked up by uh, locking out the the their account. So if you yeah. played Fortnite on the play uh, PlayStation, if you played on the Nintendo Switch when they announced the E3, you could not play using your old account. You'd have to start a new account, a f- brand new, and do it all again because Sony had locked it across. And that's really where this became a big thing right now. I mean, it's been it's been a big thing for ages, but right now, the reason why everyone's talking about it is because Fortnite, as you said, Mitch, the biggest thing in the world, and Sony has gone and gone, you know what? We're locking it out. We're doing that. Uh, and yeah. uh, it's, it, it's been a lot of pushback, that's, that's to say It's the not least. a good look <laughs> mm. when everyone wants crossplay. Just saying, like, well, you do it on our terms. And it's sort of, sort of weird. It's just, I'm thinking, that's kind of like, it kind of is different from the issue Minecraft had because Sony didn't want that. Number one, the children crap again. But number two, because it says Xbox Live. Like, they don't want any brand related to the competition. They definitely don't want any subscription-based stuff. So they don't want you you paying for... uh, The EA Access was the other thing. Like, the EA Early Access. They don't want another subscription account internal. They didn't want that. They didn't want, like... You pay for PlayStation Network, and then you also pay for EA's blah. And as you said, Microsoft, you pay for Xbox Live as well. They don't want any of that. They want it to be self-contained. But Fortnite, that's not a problem. Like, Fortnite, you should be able to play it. And they're still sticking their guns with it. So it's interesting to see what they're actually... What's going to come of this uh, current decision. Yeah, and I don't know if we'll see ramifications of that this generation i'm wondering if next gen will be the one where we see crossplay is like a standard and an expectation it's i do think i agree with you where it's like it's going to be on other pub- publishers third-party companies that is going to have to push something where it's like you know what uh considering todd howard seems to be so aggressively like anti-sony right now it's like you know what fallout 76 we're not putting it on uh, sony because they're, they're doing this shit we're just not going to release that game. I don't think they'll do that right now because it's too popular, but I think someone might make a stand at one point and you go, you know what, we're not doing it. We're not releasing the game on Sony until they allow crossplay between all of us or restrict content or whatever they want to do. Yeah, it's just you're wondering who's going to be the one to take that first shot and yeah. go up against Sony. Play. Just merge all consoles into one ultimate console. Well, that won't happen. <laughs> that's uh, that, that's probably never going to happen. That is yeah. an alternate universe in the multiverse somewhere. Yes, We course, might yeah. find that eventually, but... some. Some people would call that PC. Some people would. Well, not quite, because you don't still not get quite. like the Nintendo exclusive or the Sony exclusive. A Microsoft you do that. Not Microsoft is yet. the case. Yeah, I haven't played an exclusive on an Xbox in ages. Thanks, yeah. Microsoft. I, I guess it's the context of Sony right now. We've talked about how third parties could influence it, but it's also like Sony's winning. That's a big deal that Sony is winning at the moment. If 
next generation, they let's say it's a PS2 to PS3 transition where they suddenly are super cocky up the gate. They've got some crazy, like, maybe VR integrated, but it costs, like, $500 more or something. So they do the Kinect thing to pay that Xbox did. Yeah. <laughs> they just do anti-consumer, like, super expensive and not really showing you why you need it. Um, and then they go, all right, I'm just going to buy an Xbox then because Xbox is suddenly uh, supporting Japanese studios and they're building new IPs or something. And it's like, oh, I'd rather I'd rather get that now. And then Sony's like, oh shit, we need to actually maybe backpedal on this crossplay because it's potentially hurting us a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be exciting to see you kind of flip around. But I think crossplay is going to be an issue for a while until someone somewhere at Sony goes, you know what? Sure, why not? But while they're in the lead, don't expect them to cave in because Xbox, or back in the day, also said they're not going to do it because the 360 was winning. So. We need to wait till the lo- the winner has become the loser again, so that the loser of this generation who's pushed this forward becomes the winner again. <laughs> yeah, and Xbox can't backpedal. They can't go suddenly if Xbox or Microsoft suddenly was doing the best and go, you know what, now we won't do crossplay because that would hurt them big time. If they did oh, that. yeah, that would be a kind of flip so, around. But yeah, yeah, that's about it for the news this week because there wasn't much else. This isn't really recent, but it's always a constant problem. Okay, so to get away from the whole crossplay thing and get out of the news we're getting to the main part of the podcast now which is about games and about this year in gaming which has had a lot of exciting games and we're going to talk about those a bit later but before we move on to those there's games coming out that we're pretty excited for and to kind of kick off the conversation we're going to put on we're going to let jordan talk about his most excited game that's coming out later this year and that super hype takes us back to an age where gaming was classic platform <laughs> it wasn't classic back then that was current <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah that'd be uh the little purple dragon that everyone knows as spyro as a back. skyland the reignited trilogy mm. <laughs> yes he's finally having his own game after all this time yeah no after the skyland is so john did you play spyro back in the day any of the games i played all three of them back in the day played them a heck of a lot and I'm assuming games that I play. And I'm assuming Russell has also played all three of them. Yeah, yeah, I definitely played all three. Like, it's one of those things where, like, the question I want to ask Jordan is, Crash or Spyro? Which one? That's a tough one, but I'd probably have to go Spyro. Out of the th- out of the three, the overall amount of fun that you had in it, there's more in Spyro than there is Crash. And I mean, in Spyro, yeah. you're a dragon, so. For yeah, what? I, I, I second the opinion. Spyro's better. I think we all agree Sca- here that Spyro is better. Yeah. Skateboarding, alternate characters, chasing down gameplay. eggs. Gotta get those egg creature things. Crystal dragons, baby dragons. Yeah, so that game quite came out at the right time for all of us. So um... we've only seen gameplay footage for the first game so far. They've been very tight-lipped on the second and third games of what they look like. So hopefully, Did... we might see something like that before Didn't... the game releases. Didn't they do that with Crash Bandicoot though? Did they show Crash? What, I believe two and they, three? they they definitely showed them in separate sections at different conferences. I can't remember the exact breakdown of when they showed which ones. I but I I would expect to follow up with Jordan Gamescom. I very much expect you'll see at least Spyro two. I don't know if you'll see Spyro three, but I, Gamescom. I'm pretty confident you'll see more footage from at least the later games, not the first one. Next month. And so from what we've seen of Spyro Jordan, like how hyped are you? Because like what the, they've showed off, Spyro looks like Spyro. The graphics look pretty good, like Crash. They look better. they look them pretty good. Like they are really good for like just the transition from what it was and what it is now. Yeah, they're essentially taking Spyro back to his roots, back to the classic way that he was played. It looks as though it's going to be done just as good as what Crash was done, revamped without any major changes, keeping it all basic. Except they are adding like a new flair to it, like some dragons that you say from the crystal entrapment were just basic and bland. Some of them now actually have some story behind them like one might be a painter or one might be something yeah. else yeah but it I love... just gives it that bit more <laughs> i love the painter thing because it ties into that area so like there's all these paintings on the wall and it's like you get free the crystal dragon and that is a painter so it's like oh it all connects in the area which is cool and assuming that's what they're going to go for for the entire game like that connection to the crystal dragon being in the location yeah, yeah it's gonna be sweet so they're putting so much effort into this because I guess Crash paid off so well, and it's probably oh, one yeah. of the best-selling <laughs> games of this year because it just came out as well. So it's just like on Xbox and Switch and PC. Reason. Don't forget PC, Jordan. Don't forget it. 
Yeah, so that comes out in September, September, bleh, September 21st. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is, but on a previous video we've spoken about how good September is. And that's not the only game from September we're going to be talking about. Because Russell no. is bringing the web slinger. <laughs> the one that doesn't quite start off September, but... Is certainly the one that I'm most excited for in that month, and it's already like one of the best months, if not the best month of this year. Uh, oh and yeah, that is yeah. As I said, Spider-Man PS4. I think is just the way they're calling it, Spider-Man PS4. I think it's just called um, Spider-Man, but it's on yeah, PS4, it, or is it Marvel? Yeah, maybe that. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it's Spider-Man, and they put the PS4 in all the trailers, but I don't know if it's called that officially. Regardless, you're only playing it on PS4 because it is an exclusive title, uh, which Sony, for the most part, especially this generation, has recently is absolutely excelled with with those exclusive titles but even wiping that away just like how good sony's exclusive normally are and somex developing it jordan's a huge fan of ration clank so it's already got that back pedal on it and they're using that information to uh like the vibe of insomniac to match it to spider-man so what the coolest thing that i well, actually yeah probably the coolest thing of spider-man i've seen is the fact that they're incorporating the gadget ideas from Ration Clank and most of the games they do. Resistance. Like, having these cool items. Sunset Overdrive. Every, Sunset Overdrive, exactly. Every suit in the game, and apparently it's like 30 plus uh, Spider-Man suits, rather than just being a cosmetic change like the uh, the Batman, which is clearly influencing this game a lot, uh, the Arkham games, it the suits have an effect So based off the, what they are. So, like, the ones they've described is the punk, punk suit, like, that is one of the pre-order incentives. That one has a, the ability to pull out, like, a guitar. And then there's like the, what? I think they've got the the classic suit. The classic suit, I think, doubles your HP or something. And then the, I, I think they're not talking about the the suit for the game, like the white emblem and stuff. They said it's important or whatever the story. But I'm, I'm loving the fact that it seems like you're collecting suits. I think every suit's collectible in the game. So even though there's pre-order incentives, those incentives are a, 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 obtainable through the game. It just hmm. So you're not going to be locked out if you don't no. pre-order. So don't, currently we just know Punk and Iron Spider, Spider-Man. Don't worry about those two. If the third one's Symbiote Spider-Man, which it may be, you still can get them in the game regardless. So don't be don't be concerned about that respect. They're all in there. They're all going to be part of the complete collection. Yeah. Well. And in terms of the villains, at E3, they just went all out. It's like, let's just show them all. I was going to ask you a question about the villains. Which villain, out of the ones that showed at E3, which was a fair few, are you most excited to like go up against it's it's funny because in in a way i like classic villains are, like the ones that i think i would more likely gravitas to but at the same time like i've seen them before i've versed them before i've played them in other spider-man games i'm more excited about mr negative because he's he's a newer villain he's from the later comics and it's not one that i've seen a huge amount of material for like whether it be animated shows or movies or anything it's like he's a new character and i think he uh the way my favorite part about spider-man is all how, how how often his villains are tied to his character. And Mr. Negative is inherently tied to not only Peter Parker, but also his Aunt May in, in the connection to the, uh, like, the, uh, like the homeless uh, uh, like shelter type thing that they, uh, Mr. Negative runs. And at the same time, he's like a crime boss. So I'm really <laughs> looking forward to perversing him and, and, and him being a different character to the mm. usual Scorpion and uh, uh, Electro. Like ones that are classic, you've... Probably, if you played Spider-Man games, you've probably versed those ones before. To be honest, most of the uh, villains that they showed, I was like, eh, okay, if that's a Spider-Man villain, it's, it's, they'll be in the game, that'll be cool, but yeah, I can agree with you there. Having new characters makes it more interesting. Well, the, yeah, it does. They've been, I gotta say, they've been really cagey on symbiotes. They're just like, oh, there won't be symbiotes in the game, but I'm like, I don't believe it. I like, I, I'm, I just have a feeling that Venom will be in the game. I hope he is, because he's pretty much one of my favorite villains for Spider-Man, and I really, really hope. Uh, you you verse Venom or the, the black suits involved in the story yeah, in some way. I, I hope there's a payoff there. Yeah, it's interesting that we actually haven't seen any of like the really big iconic ones because like yeah. we know clearly that the Osb- Norman Osborn's in the game because yes, he's being elected he's for mayor. For mayor. So yeah, like and we know Spider-Man's been at this for a while, and so it just means where are we in the story? Like you've got Doc Ock and you've got like Green Goblin. Like where are they at? Venom's you probably could... had to appear at some point. You could yep. essentially say uh, Venom is similar to the Joker in the Batman series. The same similar sort of game mechanics where that might be a plot twist coming up where how he gets introduced and see it coming. Well, just the, the, the combat, it is different. Like, there's, there's a swing around the city. Looks fantastic. 
like really good just swinging in the city which is it's probably most unique thing the combat is where it's like you go okay this does look very batman-esque for people who have played it and talked about it, they said it does feel different but it there's no question they're borrowing elements of what the batman combat was like the brawl aspect using gadgets building up a combo to take down enemies like it has that effect but i, I personally love the arkham games i love the combat in them so that's all tick for me he's like yes yes yeah. yes 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 that's what's actually making me excited for that game I was like, oh yeah, Spider-Man game, yeah, that's cool. But then I really enjoyed how the Batman games recently were, and this, yeah, being the same, it's like, more more Batman, but it's Spider-Man with new enemies. Yeah, more vi- so, vi- just tracking the villains. Like, Arkham games, we're not afraid to put in, like, 20 villains in the game. Just go, yeah, go nuts. Just keep yeah. putting villains in. And it looks like it's going to have a lot of villains, and, like, Spider-Man is Marvel. Like, it's the biggest thing they've got. Like, yeah. before Avengers, before any of that, it was Spider-Man, and the game is really shaping up good. It's like when they first announced that it was Insomniac, you're like, yeah. this is going to be a good game. Everything everything we've seen about it, it's looking really good, and it's just another part of September being absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's basically like, I know it's going to be good, and it's going to be one of the best-selling games because of the license. Like, it's just going to be one of those games that's going oh, to yeah. be ridiculously well this year. Yeah, and without seeing Square Enix's Avengers, this is the only <laughs> Marvel game we've got for a while, so... Yeah, we should enjoy it. Well, we've got one. That's their games. Mine is exciting for some people, and most people won't really care about it because at this point, if you're not invested in World of Warcraft, you're not going to give a shit about World of Warcraft Battle for Azeroth. Sorry, what? What are we talking about? What, what's this game? World of Warcraft, Jordan. I've I've never heard of it. It's a game so you've is, never is been addicted game? to in your life. No, never. Never. I took that memory out of my memory. <laughs> Basically, but yeah, um, as far as this game goes, I don't think there's a game I've played anywhere even near this one, and I, I don't think a game experience has meant, any more, meant more to me than this game. For the latest expansion, the reason I'm so excited is that they're bringing back war. They're bringing back the Horde versus the Alliance. Like, the stories we always liked in Warcraft 3 and, like, the past expansions, it was always, like... We wanted the war back, and now they're bringing back the war in force because we're burning down capitals of cities, they're sieging other ones. It's like, okay, Blizzard, you're trying to take this to the next level. (laughs) Will the world be changed how it was changed in Cataclysm? Not quite. Blizzard always has the the focus on delivering something for their fans, and I think for WoW more than any other game they know, like, Anyone who's been part of that legacy for so long is going to pick up this expansion. So they want to make sure that there's story content that excites them. And obviously, Mitch, you're a huge, massive fan. And just the idea of Horde and Alliance fighting on a massive scale is like, yep, it, I'm in. I'm in. Yep. Back to killing each other, which is a good part of World of Warcraft. But yeah, it's it's good to see them trying new things and going a kind of different direction with this this time because they're actually making consequences and things that matter. If they're going full on war style, will they bring in the most popular game mode in existence right now? Hearthstone Battle Royale. <laughs> uh, fifty v fifty Battle Royale. Look, they have battlegrounds. They could technically do it, but the kind of an- they've got an answer to that. It's called war mode. So back in the day, World of Warcraft used to have two types of servers: PvP and normal. Well, they had roleplay stuff, but. The difference with those was PvP, each faction could kill each other wherever, except like home grounds, but PvE you couldn't. So now you can opt in to this big mode where anyone who wants to kill each other is put into that mode, and they're catering things for that. So you've got like objectives in the world, you've got airdrops like PUBG and Fortnite in World (laughs) of Warcraft for each faction to capture, so it's looking pretty good and... Look, Blizzard and storytelling in World of Warcraft aren't that great because Legion, the previous expansion, it felt a bit like a fan fiction of, like, Illidan comes back and he's, like, the it, hero of the light. And it's just like, what? The, the, yeah, the setup for that one just, just... I mean, I didn't play it, but just seeing the trials, I'm like, well, this already seems very fanfic. Just the, the overall structure. Oh, the, it's like, there's one moment in that expansion where I'm like, okay, like, I feel something here, but for the most part, it's kind of just like... Blizzard, you just... What are you even writing? It's just like... At times, it doesn't even make sense. And I don't know if this expansion fix it, fixes it. I've played a bit of the beta, but not enough to kind of see what's changed and what's better. Like, I basically skipped Legion for the most part, and I'm excited to jump back and play this expansion properly 
and not be left behind and experience everything that it has to offer. So cool, I'm super, super excited for you to be excited for a Jordan Adventure. Because <laughs> you have no interest. <laughs> Jordan's escaped it, but... I escaped. You escaped no and never came to back. Return. Whereas I've tried to escape and it's just caught me. It just catches me again every single time. I now have a new bait on my hook. It's called ESO. Yeah, he's replaced his old drug with a new, even better drug that's more addictive. Yes, it not, is better. Wait, what? Not advocating drug use. <laughs> no but, advocation. Remember, Australia doesn't tolerate drugs, yeah, apparently. We ban games. games for that shit, so we're serious when we say don't. So that about wraps up the games we're pretty excited for. We each brought a different one of all different genres, so it's pretty exciting to see that we're all excited for very different things. And yeah, so... We'll be back in a moment to talk about the best games we've played this year so far. Welcome back to the Gaming Booth Podcast. We've gotten rid of Jordan because he doesn't play new games, apparently. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? He's play- he played Far Cry 5. I mean, he's made a couple bad decisions this year. <laughs> <laughs> so we- we've made a few good decisions with the games we've been playing. And we've got a little list of what we've each enjoyed, but there's just one game that we can't stop talking about because it's maybe the best game of this year. Because it's God of War. Boy! This game, like, we expected it to be good. Like, there's like everything we've seen about it's like they're rebooting this hard and everything they're showing is awesome. It's it's like the the aspect of when they were showcasing it before it actually came out, where it's like, okay, God of War already, like, for me, top-tier franchise. Like, I love those games. Story has never been the greatest point, but it's still about Greek tragedy, so I still inherently like them. And you just see epic gods and all that kind of stuff. So I still like them, but uh, it didn't quite have, like, the, like, the, I'm going to ride home, like, Last like last of Us, like, best story of the year. So I'm like, it's not that level or caliber of type storytelling. Yeah, and but, then this but, comes yeah, along. Yeah, and then <laughs> God of War came along, and it hit, like what I would define as, like, a game where it hits on every single level what you want. Like, it's got excellent characters, well-written, well-acted, uh, well-performed, well-created, well-fought out. Believable as- story. Yeah, every <laughs> aspect of it that ties into the narrative that, as you said, super believable, fits the context of mythology extremely well. Uh, like just That's even an understatement. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it fits so well. Grants a greater context for the universe of God of War, which is in itself an amazing thing to achieve on essentially a reboot. I mean, it's not a reboot, but it has really like opened up the doors to like where this franchise can go and make Kratos like a compelling character. Like, he's like he's not all about revenge. He's like yeah. learnt from his mistakes, and he's so much better now. He's a dad now, and he's learning to be the dad of war. The dad of war yeah. <laughs> and I think the interactions between Kratos and Atreus are like I expected Atreus to get really annoying, but the way they wrote him and the way they wrote their interactions together, I really enjoyed both characters. It's, it's one of those things where I'm like, something I think they excelled at so well was having it feel like Kratos and at the same time actually having a story that fits that character where it's like, it didn't feel like, let's just rewrite Kratos because he doesn't talk enough. He's not a, you know, a, a very dialogue heavy character. Mm. He's very much like, brr, brr, brr. No, that's his character. But, but by having Atreus there as a character who's inquisitive, he wants to find out more, he has a tied... He has a past tied to Kratos and what else is going on. Like it's it all connects together. Um, the, it in itself creates an intriguing plot where it's like you're invested in the story. And go, I, where's this going to go? What's going to happen? What's going to happen with these characters? Yeah. Like it's, uh, even even when ultimately the setup is so simplistic, like it's your the mother died. You never see her. It's like it's just it's just she is a figure. She was important to these character two people. If they take her ashes up the mountain. That's basically God of War. That is the setup. I mean, it's just yeah. what happens around that that makes it so compelling. Yeah, it's like, it's the journey to it that is like so interesting that they've ca- created like simple goals, but like the way you get there is just really exciting and like gets you really into the world of Norse mythology, which is a world that is really interesting to explore, especially in a God of War game all about the gods. And like mythology is always flawed and very interesting, always like. All the different ones, especially Greek, like, there's a crazy mythology, yeah. but Norse is as well. So, like, merging, like, this Greek god going to this Nordic Norse mythology world is just, like, like it's a masterpiece in idea. Like It's it's such a good idea just off the get-go. And just how that ties into, like, the foreshadowing of where the series may go. It's like, yes, I am so into this. 
Uh, and I, I want more already. Just like, I want it. Yeah, and there's just one moment in this game that's just like, everyone who's played this game knows what I'm talking about, and I'm not going to say it here, but yeah, and it's just like, wow. <laughs> that, they that, did that, it. that moment is truly like, it's unbelievable how much epicness is it built off in that moment where it's like you, you feel the hype just as you go I'm like oh shit oh shit oh shit like it's just really like that when it's happening uh it's it's so good and it's, yeah. that's that's the thing i want to talk about is like the, the combat like t- to essentially scrap what the original game's combat was and then go a new direction and to me like god of War had a lot of weapons he's had a lot of weapons a blazer cast has always been his focus but never have any of them felt really that useful it's like ah the blazer cast are best why do i bother but the Leviathan Axe, I don't think it's better, but it definitely felt awesome in a way that I really think wasn't achievable until now with the ability to recall that axe. Uh, every if, hit. if you couldn't recall the axe, I don't think it would have been that cool because, like, yeah. And the, like when the first moment you're out in the wood and you're like, and you're like, okay, now you can free to do everything you want. It's just like, first thing, you throw your axe. <laughs> it's just like, that is the thing most people would have done first. Yeah, it's a, the, the amount of time I spent just like sticking the axe or throwing it off cliffs and seeing how far I could go and, and seeing what it would do and going where and see if it get caught on anything it's just like one, one of the coolest feelings is when you go to a shop when you don't have the axe on your back and he just calls just, the axe <laughs> before he does it just looks it just feels badass it's like, you know what <sighs> it reminds me of Thor Ragnarok where yep. Thor is in the um, thing with Doctor Strange he just pulls out his hand and pulls me all near and it's just like yeah, and, and there's terrible. no question like that's what the Santa Monica wanted to do. They wanted that feeling of like, look, we've seen Thor do it a hundred times. I haven't often we've seen it more if you've been reading the comics. And uh, now we want that Norse feeling. We want the feeling of like calling a weapon to you. And uh, they nailed it. They absolutely nailed the calling the weapon. It feels so good. Yeah, it's just like, and I was just saying, like, the gameplay, the story, the lore, like the music, the, the music, epic. It's like they they changed the theme. God of War had a theme in every single game. It's been the same theme, and they changed it for this one. And this one's probably better than the original theme. Like it's just so awesome. Yeah, it fits the whole thing so perfectly. And like, yeah, the graphics like they're phenomenal. It's just like mm. everything about this game is good, and it's probably why it will be game of the year. Like as far as we know, like you'd have to be like a game better than we've ever expected to be better than this game because. I- <laughs> it, 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 basically if there's a game better than God of War this year it's an absolutely amazing game like oh, yeah. it's, God of War's already like a super high pinnacle like if it's something else we have a really good year this year if there's something else that caliber but yeah like as far as both of us go like uh, it's a very important game this year and it's like one we'll be talking about for probably years to come because like we'll eventually want to speculate about the next one. Oh yeah because <laughs> it's just so much to talk about here but yeah it's God of War when well, we've got a few others to talk about Russell's got one that he recently did a platinum video for. The, the new platinum initiative, as it were, to try and like get a platinum for a, a game and uh, talk about the experience associated with that platinum. And yeah. that was Detroit Become Human, which uh, David Cage games have always had a stigma to them, where it's very much like, oh, they're pretty much just interactive stories with quick time events and interactable objects. And it's, it does kind of fit it. Like, that is kind of what they are. But... Yeah. That doesn't. Games don't have to be big action games. They can be about serious content that's focused on like opening up your mind and go, "Oh, that's interesting." Like these metaphysical ideas, or just something that uh, you come out of it and actually feel something. It isn't simply like I had enjoyable time playing this. It was like actually I kind of I felt bad <laughs> some of the decisions I made. <laughs> and narrative stories that have you making choices are kind of the best games for that. Where it's like you feel like you're impacting that story. And David Cage does them really well and i really do think detroit become human is the best he's ever done when it comes to these games mm. uh, he- heavy rain i think previously for any ones who, who have liked heavy rain i think that's the, the previous best game and i think in, in in ways the it was simpler i think the heavy rain was like it's basically a serial killer type murder situation and you have to people are under desperate situations this one is more epic in scope because it's very much about uh androids becoming sentient and then them realizing oh can't you making a choice on how that's going to play out. And that's that's the kind of interesting perspective of this game, is that normally when it comes to sci-fi, it's very much, the robots are bad, they're taking over humans, we have to stop them. That's pretty generically what people's perspective is taken. Yeah. This, is, this is the opposite. So rather, you are the androids and you have that choice. Do you want to become a rebellion and actually just kill off humans while off the planet? Or do you, do you want, want to become to... human? <laughs> yeah, do you want to become... I mean, it's always... Beca- it is the inherent narrative is becoming human. Like, they are, they're becoming yeah. self-aware. But uh, it's interesting that, and then the way it ties three characters together. So there's three different perspectives, each having 
a different end objective. One of them's Marcus is the rebellious kind of, he's building up, like, we, as a society, these androids are being mistreated, we need to do something about it, and that's kind of his more epic scope. Connor is the one I like the most, and he he's the classic, like, detective, like, he's got us, uh, he's, he's pointed up with another detective, which is Clancy Brown, uh, who, who's very likely familiar for a lot of people in a lot of different shows and animated series and whatnot. So, Mr. Krabs. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's in so much stuff. Uh, so he's, he's your partner and he's the very stereotypical just like I don't have time for this bullshit with like dealing with androids and I'm, I'm sick of this like I just want to solve the case fast possible move on kind of thing that's kind of like his attitude you know very classic noir storytelling but Connor like the juxtaposition of Connor being like this sci-fi uh, android who just can to solve everything you know he can analyze the data on the fly he can uh, taste the blood to like see what DNA is there he can Batman like rewind a scene to find exactly how it went down uh, it's just, it's really cool playing as him, and it's cool the choices he gets to make. I won't go into them, but he has, co- I really like the choices he gets to make later on. I think they're the, co- the coolest ones overall. Uh, and then Kara, who's really the heart of the story. She re- she really is the gut punch of, like, the choices she makes, is the hardest decisions, and she's really the the the, 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 the crux of the story and, and as the heart, where it's like, she wants to free this, save this girl and herself. She wants to start a new family together, and she goes through so many difficult struggles to get to that end goal, and it really feels like that's the one that's the most pressure every time she can, almost every, every single chapter she can die, so it really feels like the, the pressure's really on that, that character, and it's uh, some of the harder decisions are, are under her uh, narrative, and Gut Punch, all three together, makes an excellent story. Really do think it's the kind of next... Uh, jumping point for these narrative storytellings. I, if there, there's more of these games, I think they will be be compared to Detroit and be like, is it as good as Detroit? Yes or no? I, I think that's the kind of level I've gotten to, especially the uh, flowchart system, which in the game shows you exactly every decision you make and every other plausible decisions you can make. That was, that uh, was a really impressive part of it. Yeah, it's 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 really impressive how it ties together and really makes it easy to play it again uh, and see and and. See, like, oh, this is the uh, this is another way I could go. This is how the story can change, and you see it in real time. There's no smoke and mirrors, no fake out. So many of these games, you get to the final choice, infamously Mass Effect Three, and it's basically one, two, three choice. That's it. Uh, yeah, it's color coded. You wait, have to pick the green, the red, or the blue. Wait, with Detroit, I can't I can't even think of how many endings I've seen because it, I, I won the game myself a couple of times to get the platinum trophy, and then I, my brothers played it, my dad's played it. Like, it's a game that isn't just for gamers. Like, there are people who play it just because they want to see the story play out. And then on top of that, the amount of videos I've watched on YouTube where it's like, this video is recommended to you because it's another ending. I'm like, I didn't know that, that ending could happen. I want to see that ending. It's like, oh, sweet. <laughs> uh, it's exciting. And uh, I definitely think it's one that shouldn't be missed, even though I'm sure a lot of people did miss it. Uh, and one of the best Sony's had this year. Yeah, well, we all have to put our hands up for Detroit, but mm. there's a game I play this year that was kind of more emotional and more impacting than you'd expect. For a game that's a platformer, as difficult as Super Meat Boy, and that's Celeste. An incredible platforming game about, I guess as well as God of War, climbing a mountain. <laughs> that's true, <laughs> Solve yeah. your problems. I guess that's kind of the year in a nutshell, but like, the how this game plays is like, there's no other word to describe it other than perfect. It's like, as far as these sorts of games goes, like, Celeste is probably... One of the best, if not the best, ones of like the little really like difficult and ex- like like the difficult platformers that like Super Meat Boy kind of brought yeah. out, and it's just I mean it's extremely it's difficult, but at the same time it's like when you die you don't it wastes no time getting you back. It's just yeah. like all right now try again, and it just and as you go through the game you follow the whole story of the mountain, which is the last mountain. <laughs> it's not the player character but like the character going up the mountain like it's all about like anxiety and depression and stuff and it leaves really good messages throughout the, throughout the game for like stuff like that because like you know in some games how it's like in the load screen it's like if you die get good or something like that right, it's yeah, like yeah. this one in those kind of things it says don't worry about deaths deaths mean you're learning so it's like kind of reinforcing that like all right, this is a game. It's here to make you feel good about yourself. But at the same time, it leaves a really important message that I didn't expect from a game like this when I played. I was like, oh, yeah, it looks pretty fun. I like those sorts of games. It's just like, all right, now they're, they're trying to tell a story here that these sorts of games don't often tell. 
and that's where like you see standout titles it's like it's not just about like Celeste's super tight gameplay but mm. on the same time it's pushing forward uh intriguing interesting and compelling narrative that you go oh this this is more than just another indie like gem or something it's like this is a, a diamond in the raft as it were yeah um yeah this is like an example of some of the the reasons why indie is very important because like this does things that current ga- like big AAA games won't actually do because like what did, like if Mario 3D like not 3D world but like the 2D Mario, Mario yeah. Lanes did like all right we're going to tell you a story about Mario's depression it's just like I, I was going to say just Mario period like Mario's never told story. a story yeah like it's yeah, just basically like, how did this, he get this to happens. the Mushroom Kingdom why yeah. is he here it's like mm-hmm. why are there humans but there's not many of them there's also toads but to get back on <laughs> get back on point. We'll get back to that topic later on. No, we won't. <laughs> but it's just like, every time I think about some of my favorite games so far, Celeste is definitely one of them. Yeah. Well, admittedly, a game that I would say has zero involvement with story at all. <laughs> like, there is story there, but it's not the main crutch of why you're going to enjoy this game. And that There's was a TV dra- show for that. Yeah, exactly. Dragon Ball Fighters, A game that the previous E3, when it got announced, I was super excited for. Uh, because it just looked exactly like the anime. Exactly like it. I mean, it's more like what the anime, you remember it looking like, not what it actually did look like. Yeah. Always, always going back to classic anime, you go, oh, sh- this was nowhere near as good as I thought it was visually. Just, this you know, hasn't aged that well. Stuff. Yeah. Um, but the uh, Kurama, uh, Turama's art style is like still great, and it just looks so good in motion. Like, mm. this, this is done by the Guilty Gear team, where it's like, they have already been, they've been doing these anime-esque games for a while but they never had an ip that is so beloved so popular and maybe one of the most the biggest game like generated games ever like i'm there's probably more dragon ball z games than any other franchise in the world i wouldn't be surprised uh there's just so many you uh, can send us a message and we'll fact check it later <laughs> yeah but it, it, there, it, there's a ridiculous amount of dragon ball z games uh and and this this game is like it felt like the best fighting game i've ever played for dragon ball like i did like the old 3D kind of arena ones. Admittedly, we just saw Jump Force, and that's kind of returned to that. Um, but <laughs> this this game, it's just it's so good to play. It's always fun. Every character's like abilities, the way they transition between each other, looks so crisp, so smooth, and it always feels good. And then it has that nostalgia play because it's also playing off everything you've ever seen in Dragon Ball, uh, and it just feels so cool. <laughs> yeah, when you when you get like uh, uh, like this extra added little extra touches, like a. a Freezer like cutting like destroying Krillin and th- and those kind of things <laughs> like it's it's cool good part it's just it's just cool how they transition to the fan feedback and or having the uh, certain team lineups so it's like if you have uh, Trunks in your team and you defeat Freezer at the end like Trunks will like cut Freezer up into all the pieces oh and really destroy him, <laughs> just like he did in the anime like it's they kind of just build it for fans so if you want to make your team team lineup certain stage to mimic the anime they reward you by showing you like a scene that is a re- reminiscent of that anime and it's it's so good in that respect it's okay. it's so it's, that was a question about that like does that happen with every character that has a big scene with like the a villain so like cell how cell gets defeated yeah and how and the, margin boo gets defeated and all that correct and also the dlc characters have ones as well uh, it's not. It's not every. This is not. This is not like every character. There's a special setup scene, but as yeah. you said, every main one. So Frieza, Boo, Cell, they all have one, and they have multiple depending on which character you got, which stage you pick, that kind of thing. Yeah. To mimic a scene from the anime slash manga, I guess. Um, and uh, it and, and I said got th- got that, but then it plays just amazing. It just feels so good. I think the best work they've probably had, and it's especially when you compare it to. Capcom's work with what they did with uh, I can't remember the title, but in the Marvels of Capcom, whatever the new one was, uh, Infin- Ultimate, no, no Ult- Infinite, yeah, Infinite, yeah. It's when gonna they, mix up with Halo. I don't, I don't remember what it was. I'm like that one where the story is so bad, and it's you, you're just disappointed by all that all that aspect, and then the characters don't look right at all. You you drop the formula to really focus on just the Marvel movies, so they dropped all the popular X Men characters. And then this mm. game, right, it just it just had all the stuff you expect and you want, and it feels like that game should have felt. Um, and it, it delivered. It just delivered on the, the hype I had for it. Uh, absolutely fun to play. Uh, return every now and again. Uh, admittedly, I haven't picked up all the DLC characters, but I know we wait until they kind of complete it. The, yeah. I, I say the only thing it didn't have, especially compared to another fighting game, and that was uh, Bat... Uh, sorry, not Batman. <laughs> uh, Injustice 2, uh, where the story in that game is probably the best fighting game story I've ever played. Uh, and it, it, in itself, it's like, a, it's like a really legit, good DC like movie, like multiverse movie, where right? all combining together, fighting together. It's just and well acted, well uh, like uh, 
like mocap, all the rest of it, like it is solid. Dragon Ball Z doesn't quite have that. The story is kind of so-so. It's it's fun because you're just like seeing those characters interact where it's like, oh, uh, like characters that were dead, so couldn't possibly interact with another character, could interact. So it's like Martian Boo talking to, to uh, Cell or something. Or Freeze <laughs> talking to Cell. Like, it, fun things like that where it's just kind of fan service but yeah. it's n- never quite as compelling as like Injustice 2 got. But other than Not that, quite. excels in every other manner. Yeah, well, it's a game I'm looking at picking up. Haven't quite got to it because, as far as fighting games go, not too big into them. There'll be, but there'll be, there'll be a complete bundle once they there will be. DLC. There'll yeah. be one. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, it's like if you grow up, if you were born in the 90s, there's a big chance you've watched Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, not to mention Switch. I forgot September, I think. Yeah, another yeah. September game. Yeah, so that that in itself could be a huge deal that it's coming out on Switch. Mm. Uh, but Portable yeah, re- DBZ Fighters. Exactly. It's, that's, that's in itself a pretty cool thing. Yeah, but. For a game that will not be available on Switch, uh, maybe, it might uh, be. <laughs> yeah. maybe it's a game that's also all about its gameplay. It's a game called Into the Breach. It's a game done by the guys who made FTL, a very addictive roguelike, roguelite rather, game where it's all about spaceships. This one is about you've you've got a team of three mechs, and you have to stop an alien invasion. Which, as far as the premise goes, is really cool. It's but that's not the only cool thing about the story. It's written... Chris Avalone, who's written things like Baldur's Gate, and he's worked on so many of these classic RPGs in the past, and now he's working on Dying Light 2, for example. He's just really branching out. But the story in this game is all about time travel. Mm. So you are sent back in time from the future to fight for the past. So it's got an interesting story to it. Is this kind of like Days of Future Past type thing? Or it's like they screwed up and now they got to fix yeah, it? Yeah, they screwed up and now you have to try yeah. and fix it. So you're sent into a rant, Like you're given a map with like five points to attack. And you can do about three of them before a boss appears. And you have to fight that. So it's a turn-based game. But it's all about mechanic. It's all about the mechanics and where you position your mechs. And what the different mechs do. So you can have a mech that could push this thing backwards. And it could cover up an emergence point. Or an emergence hole, if you prefer, <laughs> where like the alien's going to appear from next round. So you can actually delay the rounds by how you position the enemies or yourself. So th- that comes into play more than you think, because like there's points where there's like an airstrike on the map where if you push your the enemy into it, they'll get blown up. If you get pushed into it, you also get blown up. So it's all about ah. positioning and strategy and like. You're also given objectives in the various maps, so it could be defend the train, and you'll get these points which you can spend to upgrade your mech later. So it's like if you fail to defend this train, and like it gets destroyed, you won't get as much. Right. Yeah. So it's like, I like, say, reminds you of StarCraft, but like StarCraft in two at least gave you like bonus objectives, and you were rewarded if you did yeah. that kind of thing. And so like when you get to the end and defeat the final boss. You can spend the reputation, which is what you've been given every time you succeed in an objective, right. which can make your mech better. And the thing is, the difference between this and FTL, like FTL, you had to make the whole run. In this game, you can tackle the final island after you beat the first one. So it's like, you can just skip all the rest and just go straight there and try to take it out. It's harder because your mech's going to yeah. be upgraded, but yeah, see, yeah. you can actually do that. And so, since it's roguelite, you're, you can you unlock new mechs, which is basically how the game progresses, and you end up building different teams of these mechs. So you can eventually unlock more mech teams, and then you can kind of combine them, mix and match, to kind of create your perfect like squad. So right, yeah, you can have a team of just fighter jet mechs, and that could be your team. And it's just like how you utilize all these things to like unlock more mechs to get further and defeat the final boss encounter it's just like it's a really good loop there that stays exciting and which is what you want in road likes you want that addictive yeah, loop you need that there because it's a very important part of like because if the gameplay isn't fun why would you want to work your way through it so yeah the fact it's got such a good interesting system is really good to see and i'd argue this game is better than ftl oh, in a okay. lot of ways it's very different game they're very different games i think this is the better work because of how it all integrates itself and how exciting it is every single time. 
does visually does it look like FTL or is it something very different? Uh, it's a grid based game. Like the art style you could say is reminiscent of FTL. Okay. Right. Yeah. But they're very different looking games. It's like it's you're giving an isometric grid. Whereas yeah. in FTL you're given like a top down view of the ship. Yeah. But you can kind of see the influences in there, but yeah, it's a game I've been playing a fair bit. I always go back to when I just want a quick game. I was gonna say one thing. When what's the what's the negative if you die? Do you have restart or do you lose resources oh, or what? Once you die, you all your mech pilots die except one. So, so like you, you can give one to continue if that person survives. So right. your whole team could be wiped out and you can start with nothing again. So it can be uh, kind of like uh, like a rogue, less rogue like, like more survival like in that respect. Like if you die, you can lose. All of it or most of it? Oh, uh, you lose your hero. You won't lose any mechs you've unlocked. Okay, you, you keep the mechs, not the heroes. Yeah, so you'll just reset because it'll be like, okay, we managed to bring him back from the past. It's just like, and he's come back with you. So you can keep right. upgrading that single one, but you can't have multiple. So if it's like you've got three really good ones and you're about to die, like, so you're only keeping one. So, yeah, it, it means there's a bit of risk and reward about how you're going to upgrade your mechs and who's going to survive because... They get passive passive effects that continue as well. Right, yeah. So they can become quite good and very useful. They could get an extra turn, do more moves in that turn or whatever. So they're very important to keep alive. But yeah, that's basically Into the Breach. And it's a really solid game that most people should try because it's really it's, good. Admittedly, I, I I think I've seen a trailer of that's it for the game. Sounds super interesting. My main question was, is it just PC right now? Yeah, so far just it's just PC. PC. Okay. I think it... I'm not sure if FTL came to consoles. But it did. It, FTL, yeah. I think, came all over the place. I can't remember. Yeah, it was available on iOS and stuff. I'd expect to see this on phones before I see it on consoles. Okay, interesting. But yeah, that's basically the best games we've played so far. As you saw in the first part, there's a couple games we're really excited about, and there's more than that there, so... Well, that's about it for the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us for the second episode of The Gaming Booth. Uh, while you're here, why not check out our other videos on the Optional Extra channel for all things gaming, and I'll thank both of these guys for joining me again, as usual. No problem, pleasure. pleasure. And yeah, we'll see you on the next one. Goodbye. Bye. Adios. Here's what I found on the web for PS4, is it in? <coughs> Have a look.